What we're going to talk about today is mostly about how to manage memory. But first, I want to talk a little bit about exam one, which will be posted shortly after class today. And we do have a winner for the concurrent collects challenge that was at the end of last class. So exam one will be posted shortly after class today. If you have really good vision and can type really fast, you can start it now. But I recommend waiting to get the easier link after class today. All of the questions you've already seen before, except for two, actually except for one. So there are six questions that are taken directly from the notes. You should be able to answer those well and know enough to, to answer them without needing uh, a lot of new insider creativity. And then there are two questions, one of which is actually from the notes, one of which is, is not, that require you to, to do a little more synthesis than thinking and putting things together. For the exam, you have until midnight Thursday, so you have a little over two days to do it. You can use any resources you want, including what's on the course site. You shouldn't post any new things on the course site that are specific to the exam questions, but you can certainly use everything that is there now, as well as everything else you can find on the internet. Just don't use other humans for help on the exam. If you do have questions about the logistics or anything specific about the exam, um, you can send those directly to me rather than posting on the course site. This is your last chance to ask questions that might be relevant to topics on the exam. So does anyone have any? Ah, OK, so which, eight, which ring is gas running in? Good question. OK, so let's remember what the rings are in x86. We had ring 0, which is the kernel. And we had ring 3, which was user level programs. And kernel level has special privileges. Can execute those privileged instructions. And at user level, we have these process abstractions and limits. That all the programs that are running at user level are running within their own memory space, so only have access to that part of the machine. So where do you want the shell to, to run? Or where, where does your gash run? Yeah. OK, good. Yeah, so this is where a gash is running. You start gash as a user. You can run gash. You didn't have to do anything special to develop gash. It's just like any program you wrote in CS101 or uh, CS1110 or any class after that. So that's where GASH is running. I won't go beyond your question, because this is uh, definitely something everyone should understand. One of the questions on the exam is whether you want GASH to run here, or you'd prefer to have GASH run in the kernel. But you should definitely understand what it means to run in those two places, and why GASH, as you implemented it and ran it, was always running in ring 3. OK, yeah. So does the terminal, when you start uh, a terminal in a Mac or you start bash in Ubuntu, where does that run? Does that have any special powers that your gash doesn't have? That also runs in, in level three. Right, so the terminal, bash, all these things are running in level three. You can run them, and you can run bash inside gash. Right? I, I think some of you tried that. If you start gash, you can run the bash program inside it and have your bash shell running inside gash. No, OK, good. So what does sudo do? So sudo is a Unix command that changes who the user is. So it makes it so the command that you're running, so let's say we did, we did sudo and that command. So what sudo does is change the user that's running. So if you do sudo, normally it's going to ask you for a password afterwards, unless you're, you've already established that you have those credentials. And it's going to change the user. So the program is still running at user level. So what happens when a program at user level does something, so here's a user level program, and let's say it tries to read a file. What are all the things that happen when the user level program tries to do some operation, like open a network port or read a file? And this is a good question. This is definitely stuff we haven't actually covered in class before, so it's not something that's going to be you're expected to know on the exam. What's happening, any of these calls that actually touch a resource, they're eventually leading to a system call that's leading into the kernel. When we do anything in a user level program that, that touches a resource, that has to be done by making a system call that goes through the kernel. And then the kernel is going to look at the program that's doing it. So the kernel is going to look at the program that's doing it, look at what it's trying to do, and decide if it has permission to do that or not. Whether you have permission to do that or not depends on the user that is running that program. And we have a, a UID that gives you the user who's responsible for running that program. And what sudo does is changes the UID. And it changes to be root. 
So your program has more permissions. So it's not running a kernel mode. It still can't do privilege instructions. But when it gets to the kernel to decide whether your program is allowed to do something, well, the kernel needs to know what user your program is running as and decide if that user has access to that resource. So that's what sudo is doing, is, it, is changing the user ID that that program is running as. But it's still running as a user level program. So it's still running in ring three. It doesn't have access to any privileged instructions in any direct way. It's still going through the operating system. It's just the operating system is going to have a different policy because it has a different user ID. Then, so that means everyone should get at least the first question, six questions on the exam completely right, and uh, hopefully the last two as well.